Hello, and welcome to Noon Conference hosted by MRI Online. Noon Conference connects the global radiology community through free, live, educational webinars that are accessible for all and is an opportunity to learn alongside top radiologists from around the world. We encourage you to ask questions and share ideas to help the community learn and grow. You can access the recording of today's conference and previous noon conferences by creating a free MRI online account. You can also sign up for a free trial of our premium membership to get access to hundreds of case-based microlearning courses across all key radiology subspecialties. Today, we are honored to welcome Dr. Stephen Rowe for a lecture entitled Prostate-Specific Membrane Antigen, PSMA, PET Interpretation and Applications. Dr. Stephen Rowe completed his medical degree and a PhD in chemistry at the University of Michigan before undertaking residency training in diagnostic radiology and nuclear medicine at Johns Hopkins. He spent seven years on the faculty at Johns Hopkins before recently moving to the University of North Carolina, where he continues his research in molecular imaging of GU oncology. At the end of the lecture, please join Dr. Rowe in a Q&A session where he will address questions you may have on today's topic. Please remember to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions so we can get to as many as we can before our time is up. With that, we are ready to begin today's lecture. Dr. Rowe, please take it from here. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's wonderful to, to be with you all today. Uh, the uh, title of my uh, talk is is perhaps a little bit different than than what may have been on the flyer, uh, but I think it uh, I think it's going to cover everything that that we'll talk about. So there are certain things about PSMA PET that we definitely know. Uh, we have uh, pivotal phase three clinical trials that make us as certain as we possibly can be in clinical medicine that PSMA PET does certain things and works as advertised in certain ways. Uh, there are some things that we might know, um, various interpretive pitfalls, which we'll talk about, uh, non-prostate cancers that have PSMA uptake, things along those lines. And then there are things that we need to know that we that we don't know yet. And that would include uh, things along the lines of response assessment, uh, radiomics, uh, artificial intelligence. And we'll, we'll touch briefly on those things as well. I, I am just recently arriving in North Carolina, so I haven't had a chance to, to change all my slides over yet. So uh, you'll see it says Johns Hopkins, and all of my slides have this kind of uh, backdrop of the Hopkins and Dome on them. So uh, apologies for that. Uh, uh, the next time I, I join you for anything, uh, I promise there'll be University of North Carolina slides. All right. So I have a, a couple of disclosures. I, I think the most relevant of which would be that I uh, I do some work with Progenix Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. Uh, I'm a, uh, a consultant for them. I'm on their their speakers bureau. Uh, they do uh, manufacture and distribute, or I suppose distribute anyway, um, uh, the PSMA agent known as Polarify, or which was previously known as DCFPYL. I do have some examples of DCFPYL uh, in in this uh, in this presentation, uh, but the principles all apply to uh, to all three of the FDA-approved uh, radio tracers that we have for PSMA, there's uh, nothing specific to clarify about uh, uh, about the uh, uh, the conclusions or uh, or any of the uh, any of the aspects of, of imaging that I'm going to be talking about. All right, just real briefly, PSMA. It's a transmembrane carboxypeptidase. It's highly expressed on prostate cancer cells. About 95% of primary tumors at least have PSMA expression. Uh, we know that that can change over time and as patients' tumors uh, evolve through various treatment uh, modalities and, uh, and change over time that, that that PSMA expression may not always be maintained. But again, at least at the, at the start point when patients have primary tumors, at least 95% of those will have PSMA expression. And there does appear to be a correlation between expression levels and tumor aggressiveness. That's a histopathologic finding. I don't know that we always perceive that, cor that, that correlation or that association uh, on the scan level uh, because of things like partial voluming effects and perhaps other things that are that are at work at the macroscopic level. Uh, but again, if you look at uh, uh, if you look at just expression levels versus tumor aggressiveness, there does seem to be a relationship there. And there are now some emerging ideas that uh, that simple metrics like SUV max on a PSMA scan may actually have prognostic significance and it probably comes back to this fundamental relationship. PSMA, is, as we said, is a, is a transmembrane protein. It has a large extracellular domain that has several sites on it that we can leverage for binding a small molecules or uh, antibodies or even other kinds of molecules uh, for both imaging and for therapy. And what we know about PSMA PET so far, and again, these, these things, uh, everything on this slide is at least backed up by prospective phase two data, uh, and most of it is backed up by prospective 
phase three pivotal trials uh, across, uh, again, every PSMA pet agent. Uh, they, they all use sort of relatively similar trial designs, in particular, uh, the, the two more recent, Polarify and Pazluma, uh, use very similar trial designs. Uh, and then Gallium PSMA 11, uh, which is sold under the trade names of Elucix and Locomets, um, the uh, the data there at least closely parallel the data from the, the other two uh, agents, even though the clinical trial designs may have been slightly different. Uh, we do know that PSMA PET has a moderate sensitivity, only a moderate sensitivity, but a very high specificity for preoperative nodal staging. We know that they have a high detection, we know that PSMA PET has a high detection efficiency for sites of biochemical recurrence. And we know that PSMA PET is effective for guiding metastasis-directed therapy for patients with limited volume or oligometastatic disease, and also for selecting patients for endoradiotherapy, uh, which are generally uh, lutetium-labeled ligands, at least in North America. They're so far lutetium-labeled ligands, uh, primarily Fluvicto, which is a regulatory approved agent, or lutetium-177, PSMA-617, as it's more broadly known. All right, so here's, here's an example of PSMA PET in a, uh, in a couple of patients with uh, high-risk prostate cancer. So, and, and again, to uh, as we'll see over the next few slides, this is sort of a, uh, an area where for nodal involvement, the sensitivity is moderate, uh, but the specificity is extremely high. Most patients that you image with uh, unfavorable intermediate high or very high-risk prostate cancer, which is typically what the guidelines suggest uh, that we should be imaging those populations, those patients are going to look like the patient on the left. They'll have very high uptake in a primary tumor in the prostate, but they won't have any evidence of nodal involvement. Um, we, we know from nomograms, these patients could have potentially up to a 25% chance of, of nodal involvement, but we also know that our sensitivity is, is moderate. So our uh, most patients, the significant majority of patients, even those at risk for nodal involvement, uh, will not have evidence of nodal involvement on the scan. Uh, my urology colleagues like to note that, that this indicates that uh, nodal staging of prostate cancer patients is still still ultimately comes down to surgery. It's ultimately surgical staging. We can do the best we can with PSMA PET, uh, but uh, the surgeon is going to find disease that, that we did not perceive on, on the PSMA scan. Occasionally, and I would say this is uncommon, patients will present more like the patient on the right, where they have unsuspected systemic disease. This patient has nodal involvement in the pelvis, in the retroperitoneum, and in the left supraclavicular space. Um, this, uh, these, these nodes are all sub-centimeter, so prior to the PSMA PET scan, this patient would have been classified as clinically localized, uh, but in this particular case, the patient actually has systemic disease. This happened a couple of times in our phase two single center trial, and a few times in uh, in the pivotal uh, phase three trial that was that was done with the same agent. Uh, but this is a relatively rare event. However, for the patient, it's life-changing in that they switch from what would be a curative, uh, attempted curative therapy uh, to a more palliative uh, paradigm where they'll be receiving uh, presumably lifetime uh, systemic therapy. All right, let's uh, let's quickly take a look at the uh, the Osprey trial, which uh, was was done with the agent that's now known as as Polarify. Uh, however, very similar trial design and uh, very similar results with uh, with uh, the other agents that are that are out there. Uh, this uh, particular trial design was sort of a follow on to the um, to the trial that was that involved both of the patients I showed you on the previous slide, which was again a single center phase two. Uh, the Osprey trial was phase three. It actually had two cohorts, but we're only gonna focus on one cohort, uh, which was uh, a total of uh, um, 268 uh, uh, patients who uh, underwent uh, a, a BCFPYL PET CT, a PSMA targeted PET CT. And of those 252 patients, underwent a radical prostatectomy with an extended pelvic lymph node dissection. The um, co-primary endpoints to the trial were sensitivity and specificity for pelvic nodal involvement. And the results of that trial, which again have been recapitulated with, with other agents uh, in, very, in very similar clinical settings, was again a sensitivity of, of only 40%, which was surprising, and that primary endpoint was missed uh, by, by in, in this particular case. Uh, interestingly, the co-primary endpoint of uh, Pazluma, uh, and again, a very similar clinical trial setting that included some patients that had uh, uh, unfavorable intermediate risk, these were all higher, very high risk patients. Uh, also, met, met, also failed to meet its um, sensitivity co-primary endpoint. But the unifying theme of these agents is that the specificity remains incredibly high. And no matter who you exclude, no matter what sort of sub-analyses you do, post hoc, 
uh, uh, playing with the numbers, you'll generally find that no matter what you sort of drive your sensitivity to, the specificity remains rock solid. This, this has important implications for how I think we should approach reading these scans. If you have a patient who's presenting for initial staging, uh, and presumably those patients are generally gonna be unfavorable intermediate, high or very high risk prostate cancer. If the specificity is it truly approaches 100% and that specificity is robust, then in places where prostate cancer would make sense to spread to, proximal external iliacs, obturator fossae, internal iliacs, um, presacral, perirectal, and then if those areas are involved, we have to start worrying about the common iliacs. And if those areas are involved, we have to start worrying about the retroperitoneum. But if we see disease that, that sort of fits that paradigm of, of where uh, prostate cancer spreads to, our specificity for that uptake is going to be incredibly high. And we should confidently call even very subtle findings. Uh, that's my approach. If I see anything above blood pool in those areas that we just described, um, and I can correlate that to a lymph node, even if it's very small, I'm highly suspicious that that lymph node has evolved. I'd say the, the caveat to this is you will sometimes encounter patients who have systemic inflammatory processes, and they'll have relatively diffuse adenopathy with low-level uptake. And I think those patients are an important pitfall to at least be aware that, uh, uh, that someone with diffuse adenopathy with uptake uh, may be fooling you and maybe in that couple of percent of patients where, where the specificity uh, doesn't quite hit 100%. All right, so we also said that we know that uh, the PSMA PET has a high detection efficiency for, for finding sites of biochemical recurrence. Uh, here you can see a local recurrence that was a cult on, uh, cult on CT, uh, but there's an enhancing nodule visible there on MRI. Even more commonly than that, patients will have one or perhaps two uh, lymph nodes in the pelvis that, that, are, that indicate their sites of recurrence. Uh, the pitfall here is trying to avoid uh, mistaking ureteral excretion for uptake in the lymph node. That can be challenging, and it's really incumbent upon us to look very carefully and make sure that we're not overcalling uh, ureteral excretion as a, as a pelvic lymph node. The uh, Condor trial was, was now one of several clinical trials that had been done in this space with various PSMA agents. Uh, Spotlight was the, uh, uh, was the Pazluma equivalent, and then there was also a, uh, a dual center study between UCSF and UCLA uh, looking at this uh, same patient population or a similar patient population uh, with Galli and PSMA 11. The results of the Condor trial, I think, also sort of inform how, how we should approach the scan, or not just the Condor trial, but, but all of these trials have, uh, have generally found similar, similar results. The big result is, uh, is actually on the next slide, but I do, want to, uh, I do want to focus on this slide for just a second. One thing the FDA has done as PSMA agents have been approved is start to, uh, is start to have all these new metrics, uh, correct localization rate, correct detection rate. These generally come down to being some variation on a theme of positive predictive value. And usually at the lesion level, although sometimes not quite at the lesion level, sometimes at more of a patient level. Uh, and it's uh, honestly, the, the FDA hasn't done us any favors here. They've, they've just kind of muddied the waters and made things confusing. However, uh, for, uh, uh, for this particular trial, the, uh, the primary endpoint was something called the correct localization rate, which was a, uh, a positive predictive value at the lesion level is at least how we should think about it. And we won't talk about the standard of truth, but there was sort of a hierarchical standard of truth. The correct localization rate does not change much with PSA level. So that's, uh, it changes a little bit. There's a trend towards higher correct localization rate at, at higher PSAs, but it's not nearly as strong as the, uh, as the relationship between uh, detection efficiency and PSA level. Again, what I think this means for how we should approach PSMA scans in the biochemical current setting is that we know that at very low PSA levels, that many of those scans are going to be negative. However, if our correct localization rate or positive predictive value at the lesion level is relatively robust across PSA levels, the same finding may mean the same thing regardless of the patient's PSA level. And what I mean by that is a small obturator fossil lymph node in a, in a biochemical recurrence patient with a PSA of 0.3 or a PSA of three 
I would treat that finding in the same way and be highly suspicious that it represents a true positive side of disease because that positive predictive value at the lesion level is, is so high regardless of PSA. So that's at least my approach to, uh, to the, uh, the scans here. Uh, but again, I, maybe the most important take home message is that PSMA isn't a magic bullet and at low PSA levels in the recurrent setting, it is not uncommon for a scan to be normal. Now, if we, if we do assume that, uh, that these, uh, that we have a high detection efficiency at uh, for most biochemical recurrence patients and that we can see things that we can't see with conventional imaging. The next step down that line is to say, well, if we see a limited volume of disease, is that patient eligible for metastasis-directed therapy, uh, perhaps avoiding or at least kicking the can down the road on, uh, on systemic therapy like androgen deprivation, which uh, in addition to things like uh, quality of life and sexual side effects also puts men at risk of um, heart attacks and strokes and other other sort of bad complications. So, uh, so we'd like to avoid that if we can. Of course, most men aren't going to be able to avoid that, but occasionally we can at least uh, perhaps buy a couple of years off of systemic therapy. Here is a patient who, after prostatectomy, had what appears to be a, a presacral or periorectal lymph node. That was the only visible sign of disease on a PSMA scan. Uh, the patient uh, underwent. Uh, stereotactic body radiation therapy to that side of disease, did not start systemic therapy. His PSA became undetectable. And the, over the two years of follow-up of, of this particular study, uh, his PSA never became detectable again. I have absolutely no idea if this patient's cured. I, I would be hesitant to use cure in anyone who has disease outside of the prostate, but at least this patient spent at least two years without requiring androgen deprivation therapy. We also see things at the other end of the spectrum where, again, the lack of sensitivity of conventional imaging may fool us. Uh, here was a bone scan that had maybe one suspicious spot on it. Uh, but uh, in fact, this patient had hundreds of marrow-based lesions that were uh, invisible on both CT and bone scan. So this patient obviously not eligible for metastasis-directed therapy. Uh, this patient's volume of disease requires that, uh, that he undergo systemic therapy. And there are patients that sort of fall in the middle. They have low volume disease, but perhaps not as low volume as we'd like. Uh, this patient, for instance, has both pelvic and retroperitoneal adenopathy, and went SBRT without starting uh, without starting ADT, uh, and returned a few months later for a follow up PSMA PET scan, and it was found to have disseminated bone metastases. So those bone metastases were almost certainly there prior to him undergoing radiation therapy, but they were perhaps below the detection efficiency of the scan. So again, PSMA, not a magic bullet. Uh, it will serve some patients well in selecting them for metastasis directed therapy. Uh, in other patients, uh, it, may not, uh, it may not serve so well because they may just have such low volume disease, if you will, the true micrometastatic disease uh, that we're just not able to treat all of their sites of disease. However, if a, if a man has sort of progressed to the point that he has more widespread metastatic disease, and in particular in the US, this would mean post-chemotherapy metastatic castration-resistant disease uh, to be eligible for treatment with Lutetia and PSMA, or again in the US right now, that's Puvicto. Uh, these, uh, uh, we, we select patients uh, for Pluvicto with, uh, uh, with a PSMA scan up front uh, so that we can confirm that they have both sites of disease that, that have, uh, that are expressing the target, and also that they don't have sites of disease that aren't expressing the target and that won't benefit from, from PSMA targeted into radiotherapy. Uh, somewhere around 40% of patients that are treated are going to have an objective biochemical response with a, a greater than 50% drop in their PSA. There will be about 70% of patients that have any drop in their PSA. Uh, and that efficacy all comes in, in, a, uh, in a relatively small cost in terms of toxicities. Uh, there can be uh, nephropathy, but it's generally low grade and self-limited. There can be xerostomia, again, generally low grade and self-limited. And we now have sort of the pivotal trial results with the TCM PSMA 617. Uh, this was the vision trials published in the New England Journal a couple of years ago. Uh, and it showed that in a prospective multicenter setting that uh, there was uh, improvement in, in progression-free survival, freedom from skeletal events, and then the big one, of course, overall survival in those patients who uh, received uh, Pluvicto on top of best standard of care therapy relative to those men who only received best standard of care therapy. Let me, uh, let me shift gears a little bit from what we know to what we think we might know. And uh, I think there's, uh, there's a drive right now, uh, among, this is one of my, my academic interests, and, uh, but it's also academic interests of other folks that um, 
we we need to we need to do a better job of, of sort of bringing in, in into alignment uh, everyone's interpretations of the same findings. Uh, you'll find a lot of interreader uh, a lot of interreader variability right now in terms of how people approach findings on on scans. A solitary rib a solitary rib lesion may be a metastasis to one reader, and it may be fibrous dysplasia to another reader. And of course, all of this is going to eventually, uh, hopefully, shake out as as we collectively become more experienced and all read hundreds or even thousands of these scans over the years. But we uh, uh, we do need some way of homogenizing our interpretations. We need to communicate findings to our clinical colleagues, uh, and other fields have already done this. And, and PIRADS is probably the big one. Uh, I I sort of came into being as a radiologist when PIRADS already existed, but all the stories I hear about uh, sort of the pre-PIRADS era was that, uh, uh, you know, no one, uh, uh, everyone was reading prostate MRI differently. Everyone was interpreting what those reads meant differently. And it was hard to sort of get a nice coherent signal out of that noise. And PIRADS sort of brought everything into alignment where now the expectation is everyone's reading uh, with PIRADS. There may still be some interreader variability, of course, but at least PIRADS has provided sort of a structure that they, uh, that can, uh, uh, on which everyone can hang their hat. Now, there are a number of competing approaches, but I'm only going to talk about one, and that's PSMA RADS, uh, since it's kind of like BIRADS, or at least uh, uh, is potentially like BIRADS, or PIRADS, and then it's a, a Likert scale of, of uh, how uh, likely prostate cancer is in given patients. But let me first show you some pitfalls as to why this would be an important thing to do. Uh, obviously, if everything that's hot on the scan is cancer, and everything that isn't hot on the scan isn't cancer, uh, our lives would be a lot easier, uh, but of course there are pitfalls in both directions. For example, a, uh, a scan that may have negative or variable uptake, uh, as in this patient, uh, may indicate that a patient has neuroendocrine prostate cancer. Neuroendocrine prostate cancer tends to lose PSMA expression, and so you can get what are uh, absolutely biopsy-proven positive liver metastases in a patient that doesn't wind up having any PSMA uptake. Uh, and this is just the, the biopsy evidence of that. So <clears throat> uh, adenocarcinoma uh, has PSMA expression, but as you can see in those central couple of panels, all that PSMA expression goes away in the sort of truly neuroendocrine differentiated prostate cancer that was present in the liver of this patient. Uh, there are other things that are probably neovascularized or inflamed that can have PSMA uptake. Uh, we don't necessarily always understand the biology of this, but here's one example. This is a patient with a vertebral compression fracture. This, uh, uh, this has nice linear uptake. It looks a lot like it would on, say, an FDG PET scan, uh, but no focality here to suggest that this is a, uh, a, tr a pathologic compression fracture. Maybe one of the more famous pitfalls in, uh, in PSMA imaging is the presence of uh, peripheral ganglia. So dorsal root ganglia, cervical thoracic or stellate ganglia, and celiac ganglia are all variably positive in patients. And the celiac ganglion is, is really the hardest one. So that's the panel in the upper right there, a couple of panels in the upper right. It looks like a retroperitoneal lymph node. It looks for all the world like a retroperitoneal lymph node. And in some patients, it's quite prominent. In some patients, it's quite avid. So really, it's incumbent upon us to know the anatomy well and not mistake these lesions for, uh, or not mistake these normal structures with variable uptake for sites of prostate cancer. Now, here's just another example of that. Uh, and here, here's that, that celiac ganglion. So again, it really does look like a lymph node. It's kind of kidney bean shaped. Uh, and this patient is relatively prominent and they have relatively prominent uptake. Uh, but again, we just have to be very careful not to, uh, not to mistakenly call those sites of prostate cancer. Uh, and then here's, uh, here's an example of the bone. The bones are, are full of hazards for those of us interpreting these scans. Uh, here's a patient who had Paget's disease in the sacrum. Which, uh, which had uptake throughout the sacrum. Uh, you can see the bone scan there also had uptake throughout the sacrum. Uh, but, uh, uh, but the MRI shows, uh, shows that there's preservation of the intramedullary fat. So this is just a nice example of Paget's disease. And as noted, inflammatory things can, can have uptake. So here's a, a patient with cortical laminar necrosis after getting radiation therapy to the brain. Uh, you can see that there's uptake in the uh, areas of enhancement uh, on, the, uh, on the MRI. So this, uh, uh, this uptake is, uh, is potentially confusing to us. You'll see this in other parts of the body as well. Patients who have gotten prior SBRT uh, to say a rib lesion, the underlying lung, the post-radiation changes there uh, will often have low level diffuse uptake. 
And then there's PSMA expression in non-prostate cancers. And this is primarily in the tumor neovasculature, the neovascular endothelium. Uh, but uh, while we can potentially leverage this in these other cancers for diagnostic purposes, we also have to really be aware that if a pattern of apparent disease does not uh, comport with what we believe prostate cancer should look like, we may have to suggest that another prostate or that another cancer type is present. Let me show you a couple of examples of what used to be called conventional renal cell carcinoma. We now call clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Uh, and here's a patient with relatively widespread metastases. Perhaps the clue on his whole body MIP image is that he's missing a kidney. Uh, but these were all uh, these were all metastatic renal cell carcinoma, uh, and specifically clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And you can see even very very small lesions. There, there's quite avid uptake. But I would uh, I would posit that something like a uh, subcutaneous perineal metastasis would be highly unusual in prostate cancer. Something like an intramuscular metastasis would be highly unusual in prostate cancer. But those things may indicate the presence of, of something like a renal cell carcinoma that has more unusual patterns of disease spread. Uh, brain parenchymal metastases would also be very unusual in prostate cancer. Uh, here is one from, uh, from, again, a clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And then relative to FDG, I, I tend to think FDG gets kind of a bad rap for RCC. It's not bad in the metastatic setting, uh, but in a patient uh, contemporaneously imaged with, uh, with FDG and PSMA, uh, the PSMA not only had higher uptake in known lesions, but also, uh, uh, but also uh, wound up uh, picking up a couple of lesions that would have been missed on the FDG scan. And then one last example of a clear cell RCC. This is a patient who was imaged uh, right before he passed away, unfortunately, and then underwent a rapid autopsy. And so uh, sites of disease that would have potentially been very hard to biopsy, such as intramuscular metastases, uh, were, were available for, for histopathologic inspection. So not only does uh, PSMA do a sensitive job of picking up clear cell renal cell carcinoma mets, uh, it also is very specific for, for those same metastases. Uh, I would say it is, uh, again, perhaps most important for those of us reading this, this uh, modality for prostate cancer, just to be aware that very strange patterns of spread from prostate, what look like strange patterns of spread for prostate cancer may be something else. And again, we, we have to be aware, we do have to be aware of that. Uh, let me show you uh, a couple of, uh, these are sort of high-grade glioma examples. I, I don't think this is a specific finding, as you saw, post-radiation changes can also have uptake. So the uh, uh, so while not specific, uh, this uh, areas of blood-brain barrier breakdown will be highlighted by by PSMA scans. There's at least some uptake of PSMA in uh, in thyroid cancer. Uh, I've overall been, however, disappointed with our experience with trying to image these patients. Uh, there seems to be both disease that's iodine avid, PSMA negative, uh, disease that is iodine avid, PSMA avid, and disease that is uh, I, uh, uh, let's see, I forget even what I said, uh, that's uh, iodine negative, PSMA avid. So all those things, all those permutations can exist. So I don't know that there's a great role for, for PSMA PET moving forward in thyroid cancer. But all of this brings us to the idea that, again, we have to have ways of either uh, structuring our interpretation of what we think these various things are, these various pitfalls or not prostate cancers, and we have to communicate that to our clinical colleagues uh, and help them sort of make decisions as to uh, what new workup, uh, what new workup steps might be for the patient if it's not so straightforward as just they have prostate cancer in this site and this in that site. Uh, in our clinical, uh, in our clinical. Uh, Workflow. Uh, we use PSMA RADs. Uh, I suppose to some degree this is our bias. We we uh, sort of developed and validated this system, so so it does tend to be something that uh, that we're very comfortable with. Uh, there there are other systems out there. Uh, Promise. Uh, there's an original sort of EANM uh, Delphi consensus model, and then there's something called ePSMA, which tried to subsume all of those things together, uh, but uh, wound up uh, perhaps becoming a little overcomplicated. And then uh, there are new efforts. There's now a PSMA RADS 2.0. There's also a Promise 2.0. Uh, all, but all these things have the same goal of trying to standardize some aspect of our approach to the scan. Uh, I'll very, very briefly show you sort of uh, what, we, uh, what we've done with, uh, with sort of PSMA RADS version 1, uh, which was really just a, a, a way to, again, create a five-point scale of likelihood of prostate cancer. One is definitively not prostate cancer, uh, either from there not being any findings or 
from things that do have uptake uh, being either biopsy proven or pathognomonically shown on some other imaging to uh, not be sites of prostate cancer. PSMA rats too, things that are very unlikely to be prostate cancer, uh, but perhaps a low level uptake in something that could be obscuring a site of prostate cancer. PSMA rads 3 has, has subcategories, uh, and those include uh, rads 3A for uh, indeterminate soft tissue, rads 3B for indeterminate bone, uh, just because of the workup, uh, the sort of workup steps for each of those might be a little different. That's why we, we subcategorize them. And then things that uh, uh, PSMA rads 3, 3C are things that might be other cancers, uh, but that have uptake. Uh, here you can see an example of a potential lung cancer. Uh, this was an isolated finding in this patient. We will always, within reason, try to get tissue on isolated findings in the lungs. Uh, although they often do turn out to be prostate cancer, that is still a relatively rare pattern of, of disease spread for prostate cancer. So our, our preference is to make sure that it isn't an underlying lung cancer. Uh, you can see there are also things that might be cancer, such as a relatively large pulmonary nodule that lack uptake of, of PSMA-targeted agents, and those we would categorize as a PSMA rats 3D. And then the fours and fives are easy. Fours are things that are uh, almost certainly prostate cancer, but don't necessarily have a CT correlate. It might be a subcentimeter lymph node. It might be a bone lesion that's marrow-based and doesn't have a, an associated sclerotic reaction. And then those things that uh, are either things like enlarged lymph nodes or sclerotic bone lesions that have uptake, uh, those go into the five category. So it's it's a relatively simple approach, uh, but it does make you come down hard on sort of giving some kind of number or decision to things that uh, that may, uh, uh, where it may have to make a decision, does this need additional workup or is this definitively benign or is it uh, is it not definitively benign? All right, this is just an example. Uh, I won't, won't go into the details here. Um, this uh, this approach has a uh, has a higher high inner observer reliability, uh, both on sort of an overall scan score, highest score for for an individual lesion, as well as individual lesion scores. Th these aren't perfect, uh, and experience does matter. Experience readers will tend to cluster together a little bit more, but relative to something like pyrads, the the repeatability here is actually substantially higher. And those things that are indeterminate, unfortunately, really are indeterminate. So if it's an indeterminate lymph node, uh, when you follow it up over time, maybe about 75% of those will manifest as, as having been true positive and maybe 25% won't. Uh, and uh, bone lesions, it's actually worse. So with bone lesions, the uh, uh, only about 20% of indeterminate bone lesions wind up, uh, wind up being, uh, uh, being true positive on follow-up. And advanced reconstruction algorithms can help a little bit. Here's just a patient who is imaged with and without a, a point spread function reconstruction. And you can see a, a lymph node that's maybe a little wishy-washy, although probably callable in the top couple of panels uh, is, uh, is more definitively callable in the, uh, in the bottom panels. All right, so let me let me move on to some emerging ideas. So these are things we, we don't know, but, but hopefully will at some point. And, there are uh, there are things here I'll probably go by pretty quickly. Uh, make sure we we have time for for questions because we've probably covered sort of the the really practical aspects of things up up to this point. And now we're we're going to uh, do some thought exercises about maybe where the field of, of PSMA PET is headed. So let me uh, but let me launch uh, right into things. Uh, so very briefly, image quantitation. So I'm a big believer in image quantitation from perspective of biomarker development. I don't think there are meaningful PSA PSMA SUV cutoffs that we can really apply. But I can tell you that uh, liver uptake is highly reproducible uh, across various radio tracers. Uh, they'll all have different liver uptakes, but the liver uptake is sort of the most repeatable organ in, in PSMA PET. Uh, there's also, there's an agent over in Europe called PSMA 1007 that has very high liver uptake because it's hepatobiliary excreted. Uh, so that I actually don't know if the if the quantitation is most repeatable in the liver, but for the agents that are FDA approved in the U.S., this uh, this would hold true. Uh, there probably is some sort of tumor sink effect when you see really extreme degrees of of tumor infiltration, particularly in the skeleton. There's definitely a drop in uptake in other organs, but it doesn't really come into play at sort of the uh, the levels of disease that we often see. Here you can see three patients who have varying levels of, of disease involvement, but it really looks like their, their organs are all very similar in degrees of uptake. Again, there's a little bit of a tumor sink effect, but it is uh, there are other things that affect PSMA uptake that 
that would also play a role in sort of the day-to-day -day variability. So it won't be all tumor sync effect uh, or just differences in sort of tumor volume between patients. Uh, let's see, I think I'm gonna skip that. Uh, but here, uh, but here I'm gonna, I'm gonna maybe slow down just a little bit because I, I think here we have a couple of important ideas. So uh, we know that, uh, we know that uh, test retest studies are not easy to do. Uh, patients uh, getting imaged, you know, at one time and then again, you know, within a week without any intercurrent therapy or, or initiation of new therapy. Uh, it's hard to sort of line all that up. It's expensive to do that. It's lots of scanner time. But uh, we uh, were lucky enough to have the Prostate Cancer Foundation uh, fund us to do a test retest trial uh, with pa in patients with metastatic disease uh, with, uh, with a PSMA PET scan. And turns out that, uh, that the scans are highly repeatable. So uh, even in low volume disease or in high volume disease, uh, the SUVs are, are robust. Uh, and uh, here you can see some land Altman plots and correlations. Uh, the, I will say that the, the SUVs are more robust at higher SUVs. So as you get these patients who have metastatic castration resistance, extensive volumes of disease and very high SUVs, those SUVs will be very repeatable. So the idea that uh, a, a solitary PSMA scan at, at, at a sort of a time point prior to initiation of something like Zuvicto uh, is going to tell you something about the dosimetry of those patients and how much dose their tumor is going to get. I think there's a lot of validity to that idea. I don't know that we're leveraging that very well, but hopefully we will at some point. But, uh, but again, yeah, higher SUVs, are more robustly repeatable. Uh, and I think that's in and of itself an interesting finding. The SUVs and FDG PET just don't have the dynamic range to actually have told us that, although it's relatively intuitive perhaps, uh, but we, we didn't know that prior to the advent of, of PSMA PET, uh, where we would have SUVs from down at uh, you know 0.8 or 0.9 sometimes in early subtle sites of disease up to over 100 in, uh, in really avid sites of disease. All right, this is just more about that. Okay, so radiomics has, has gotten a lot of play and it would be great if radiomics could perhaps uh, provide us some insights or predictive biomarkers uh, that might tell us something about PSMA PET. Unfortunately, I don't tend to be a huge believer in, in radiomics for PET in general. Uh, there are broad categories of things that tend to be uh, sort of low frequency features of the images, things like entropy or homogeneity uh, that do have some repeatability or reproducibility uh, at the uh, at the radiomic level. Uh, I'll also say though that uh, um, that most radiomic features are not reproducible, and that has to do with with aspects of the the pet reconstruction matrix where there are uh, unestimable parameters that are high frequency features of the images that are basically going to never be repeatable because we're just throwing random numbers in that uh, in that reconstruction matrix. I uh, probably need to update this. If you would like to read more, uh, this uh, manuscript's now been published in uh, uh, in uh, the prostate. Uh, Rudy Werner, who's done a lot of uh, a lot of this work, uh, uh, who's over at Würzburg, uh, is the first author on that paper. It, it's worth a read. It's kind of an interesting fundamental pet uh, fundamental pet finding that that just happens to be applied in this case to PSMA. And artificial intelligence, you know, I think every radiologist worries that at some point uh, these algorithms are going to get so good at looking at images that we're going to be out of jobs. Uh, I, I think our, our jobs are hard enough that that isn't like right on the horizon, but, uh, but it is certainly going to come to pass that AI is going to replace a lot of what we do day to day. So we do have to at least have that in the back of our minds. Right now, AI, I think, is going to be more of a friend to us. It's going to help us with lesion classification. We can do whole body tumor burden assessments uh, and prognostication and decision making will, will hopefully be things that we can start to lean on AI for a little bit. Uh, with PSMA PET, AI is already pretty good. I, I think it's better at hotspot detection than it really is at classification. Uh, the the FDA approved product that's out there that's that's a sort of PSMA AI tool uh, will pick up solitary rib lesions that are fibrous dysplasia and things like that. It's basically picking up things that are outside of the normal biodistribution. It does a very good job at that. It provides a quantitative readout, uh, but it isn't at the point where it's helping us make decisions about what the lesions really are, or what the site's uptake really are, and how seriously we need to take them. 
that's really where we have to go for AI to ultimately be useful with, for us in this this context. Uh, but uh, but it uh, isn't quite there yet. I think it's it's a question of data and a follow up and uh, and really good data. So data that is based on uh, uh, that's based on either long term follow up or or histopathology correlations. And and that kind of data is sort of hit and miss in the field. I uh, I was wondering if we can supercharge some of these sort of uh, um, the these very image oriented algorithms with even better images. Uh, this is just an example of cinematic rendering of of a of a PSMA PET CT, which is uh, uh, which is a, a technique that was pioneered by by Siemens. Uh, it's available on their VB forty and above workstations, I think. Uh, and uh, this part isn't necessarily out there and ready for prime time yet. Uh, to differentiate the pet data from the CT data, you have to internally light the pet data. Uh, but nonetheless, I'd, I'd really be curious if uh, if uh, GPUs can sort of derive more out of these uh, interesting and color coded uh, and sort of uh, one 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 scan and one image kind of image uh, than they can out of sort of just the 2D images being being fed, generally fed to them. We, uh, in addition to uh, in addition to thinking about radiomics and AI, uh, we need to also think just more broadly about imaging biomarker development. I I think this is this is where a lot of the field of PSMA is headed. Uh, again, some of that will be driven by by AI and uh, and perhaps by radiomics to some degree, but. But we can do simpler things than that. We can we can look at uh, say in this particular it was very nice study from uh, from the Netherlands and Australia. They looked at patients who were PSMA positive uh, on the scan, uh, histopathology negative, or I'm sorry, histopathology positive, and then patients who were negative on the scan and histopathology positive. So essentially, false negative scans. Those false negative scans, those patients did a lot better. So the false negative scan is a prognostic biomarker of how the patient's going to do with surgery and how long their biochemical uh, recurrence-free survival will be. Uh, another example, perhaps, of an imaging biomarker is that if we uh, if we look at the phase two oral trial, this is a post hoc analysis, but nonetheless, a, a nice post hoc analysis. It shows that if you uh, if you treat everything that's PSMA avid. Uh, and visible on conventional imaging versus everything that's only visible on conventional imaging, the patients who got everything that was PSMA avid treated did better than those patients who may have had PSMA avid disease that wasn't visible on conventional imaging. Not a surprise, perhaps, but shows us that uh, that we have to be using sensitive imaging if we're going to do this. And then if we use that sensitive imaging, we know that those patients are generally going to do very well. Uh, now, uh, maybe switching gears a little bit, but but keeping in the sort of imaging biomarker space, uh, initial experience with with PSMA in response to ADT. So there's a uh, poorly understood biology of increasing PSMA expression uh, with a decrease in androgen signaling. That's at least what happens in the lab. Is whether that really happens in patients is hard to say. Uh, here is a patient in whom that did seem to hold true, where the initiation of ADT uh, brought out new lesions and made other lesions more avid. It seemed like this was going to be a way that we could um, all of a sudden now give Pluvicto after a shot of ADT, uh, and the patient's going to respond really well. Or if we're trying to do metastasis directed therapy, maybe we find one new site of disease, and, and that changes uh, how we treat the patient. But uh, but it turns out it's actually much uglier than this. Uh, and so if, if you look at sort of a different context of cutting off androgen signaling with abiraterone or enzalutamide, uh, patient scans do all sorts of things. Some get hotter, some get colder, some have new disease, some don't. Uh, but you can sort out on kind of a whole body level what the, what the imaging biomarkers are, and they have associations with uh, time to therapy change and overall survival. So it's exciting to think that our changes in uptake are going to uh, sort of, or sort of a dynamic readout of changes in uptake can tell us how a patient is doing when they're going to need to change therapy, how long they're going to live. Uh, AI is certainly going to help us with this. We we have to really mine mine out these uh, uh, these studies and do larger studies that are really going to help us with this. And we'll talk about that. Uh, and PSMA PET has the the opportunity to help us in places where 
uh, where something like a PSA may fall apart. So patients will eventually develop what may be PSA non-secreting tumors. They may still have PSMA expression. And there are difficult situations like bipolar androgen therapy where patients are androgen deprived, but every six weeks get super physiologic testosterone. Well, their PSAs of course spike when they get that testosterone, but does that mean they're progressing or, is, or are we just maintaining sort of the sensitivity of their, their disease for, for, for androgen uh, signaling, uh, for, for things that target androgen signaling? And turns out if you have any lesions, you are progressing, then eventually that'll manifest on CT and bone scan, but you can tell it earlier on PSMA. So that early time point PSMA, again, may be sort of a, a real biomarker for, for whether the patient's doing well on, the, uh, well on that, that given therapy or not, and whether they need to change therapy. With that, I'll, I'll kind of wrap up, and I, I think I'm about on track to, to have uh, some good time here to answer some questions, but um, I would just like to, to wrap up by saying there are already multiple indications for diagnostic PSMA-based imaging. We've, we've talked about those. There are interpretive pitfalls that suggest a need for a structured reporting approach. It doesn't have to be PSMA RADs. Yeah, that's my bias, but uh, uh, PSMA RADs promise EPSMA. Uh, I think uh, all of us should at least think about these, uh, think about these possibilities. And then uh, we're just starting to understand PSMA targeted pet findings as imaging biomarkers, and we have a lot of work left to do uh, uh, to really, uh, to really make that happen. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, uh, stop sharing. Uh, I think there's maybe some questions and some Q and A, and I will. Uh, I, I'm going to start uh, taking those. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, uh, first come, uh, first come, first serve, and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll get as many of these answered in the next uh, uh, 15 minutes or so. All right. So looks like the the first question was, uh, what's the threshold PSA after prostatectomy can re reliably detect recurrent or metastatic disease? Um, so this is. Uh, this is a, a controversial topic, and but I think a, a very good question. So certainly, if you wait longer and as the PSA goes up, your uh, uh, your chance of the scan being positive or, is going to go up. But of course, the chance that the patient also has disseminated disease and isn't going to respond to salvage radiotherapy also goes up. So what uh, what I generally tell our clinicians and uh, and our our clinical practice pattern has been that if the clinician is going to pull the trigger on a salvage therapy, they should get the PSMA scan first. Nothing's worse than say doing salvage radiation for a patient and then their PSA keeps climbing and then eventually we get a PSMA scan and sure enough, they had you know, a lymph node that was outside of the salvage field. So no matter what the PSA is, if salvage radiation therapy is gonna be the next step, probably gonna need to get the PSMA scan first. Uh, uh, again, before, uh, just not to have any regrets later. It doesn't mean that the scan is going to be positive. We may not see the site of disease, but we at least know that we weren't sitting on sort of a deal breaker lesion that we just missed because we didn't image. I would say insurances can have problems with, with imaging at PSAs below 0.2 because all the data we have is at 0.2 and higher post prostatectomy. So it is, uh, uh, it isn't clear exactly how insurers are going to cover that, but uh, but from a scientific standpoint, I think we're justified to scan patients uh, so long as it's before uh, before the next step in their therapy. And then uh, the next question: uh, Can PSMA PET replace MRI for making a diagnosis of local staging? Uh, I would say they're they're complementary. Um, it's hard to see EPE, for instance, on uh, on PSMA PET. It is uh, relatively you know, it's at least possible to see it on MRI. I think PSMA PET is very good for seminal vesicle invasion. That's a little anecdotal, but it just seems like it's really good for seminal vesicle invasion. Uh, but what PSMA PET really gets you is, um, is the uh, sort of local regional staging, the, the pelvic lymph nodes that may be too small to call an MR. Uh, and then of course it gives you a, a wider field of view systemic staging. In an ideal world, I suppose we'd all have uh, really nice uh, PET MRs. Um, but uh, but not every place does and not every place will. Uh, so I, 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 I do view the modalities as complementary, and I, I think it makes a lot of sense for patients to, to get both if, if that's possible. Uh, let's see, do, uh, do you try to do initial staging PSMA PET before giving ADT? Uh, again, you know, I guess if the patient's going to get systemic therapy no matter what, it, the PSMA PET may not Try, may not add a ton of value. I, I think the real value of PSMA PET is trying to find those patients who have low volume uh, metastatic disease or local regionally recurrent disease that, that may have sort of salvage options like SBRT. Uh, but 
if uh, uh, to really get an idea of a patient's extent of disease, I do believe and sort of PSMA PET before initiating systemic therapy, just because the PSMA PET is going to be hard to interpret after the systemic therapy. As, as you sort of saw in a couple of examples, um, the lesions can do all sorts of things. So it is, it's just very hard to interpret PSMA PET in, right after the initiation of ADT. So, so I'd, I'd certainly prefer to have it uh, uh, early, before than, than just have it after. Uh, is there a way to compare the FDG and PSMA scans for progression or response to ADT if a patient has undergone FDG prior? Yeah, I, you know, if a patient's disease is FDG avid, and, and many castration resistant patients will actually have a fair bit of FDG avidity, um, then, uh, then I, uh, I think you can follow them by FDG, and that's probably a decent way to follow them uh, because their disease is, is going to be from that point on glycolytically active. And so if you if you see that loss of glycolytic activity, I, I think that's actually a good way to follow them. Uh, a combination of PSMA and FDG, unfortunately, mud, muddies the waters quite a bit. So I, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure exactly how to sort of take the, the combination of the two of them. Like if you saw sort of new lesions on PSMA that, that weren't FDG avid, you know, would you believe them? I, I guess I would, but, um, but it is... Uh, it is certainly hard to follow with both modalities. We don't have great data on following with both with both modalities. So if they if they have avidity on one, I would probably try to stick to that one uh, and and uh, and follow follow them along those lines. All right, uh, use of PSMA in initial evaluation of patients found on screen to have elevated PSA and may not do well with MRI screening. Yeah, so so there's a little bit of data on this. There's a, a trial called the Primary Trial from Australia uses gallium PSMA eleven. And they reported that uh, the PSMA was actually a little bit better than MRI at finding clinically significant disease. Uh, I can tell you my anecdotal experience is that they almost always find the same thing if there's clinically significant disease. I don't, I don't know that I find PSMA up front as, as definitively better. Uh, although again, the only sort of published literature would say that, that it's at least a little better. In terms of patients that can't get MRI screening, I, I think the, the, the big holdup would be would be insurance. Uh, I think insurance is, is now pretty cool with, with MRI as sort of a secondary screening modality for patients with elevated PSA, uh, but there are no guidelines that recommend PSMA PET in that context. And in a patient who, in fact, the guidelines specifically say PSMA PET is only for men with prostate cancer. So uh, an insurance company would have a pretty solid foundation to stand on to say that uh, this patient doesn't have to confirm prostate cancer or we're not gonna pay for their PSMA PET. However, if, if insurance is okay with it, then uh, I think it can be a very useful adjunct to MRI. MRI is probably still the gold standard in that space, at least in my mind, uh, based on the, the level of data that's out there. But, uh, but it is, uh, for a patient that maybe can't get an MRI, I, uh, uh, if you can't get a PSMA PET, it can't be useful. All right, uh, do I have experience with Pazluma and what I consider it equivalent to Polarify? Uh, so uh, yes and yes. So I, uh, I, I've uh, read, I don't know, probably 80 or so Pazluma scans uh, that uh, were done on various trials and whatnot. And uh, my, uh, my experience with it is pretty much exactly as the companies describe it, or, or at least uh, uh, somewhat as they describe it. Uh, there is less urinary excretion than Polarify. So I do think you potentially get a little bit of an improved uh, look at the pelvis. Uh, there's probably a little bit more false positive bone uptake. Again, that's anecdotal. I don't really have data on that, but, uh, but my, my observation was I would sometimes see things that I was sure were benign bone lesions that seem to have uh, Pazuma uptake. Uh, of course, I don't have head-to-head -head necessary Pazuma and Polarify uh, uh, scans in, in a, any significant number of patients. But, uh, but yeah, my, uh, uh, my impression from the clinical trials that were done is that they are statistically equivalent and we should, uh, from a guidelines perspective and, and use of them in, in different indications, uh, we should be comfortable with either one. Uh, can you share your protocol for PSA imaging for Polarify? Uh, do you think the imaging in two hours is beneficial? Uh, another great question. I think that uh, I think that there are occasionally lesions that show up at two hours that don't show up at one hour. And it is possible that, uh, it is possible that that may make a difference in, in one patient or another. Um, I'm not, you know, you, you never sort of know, there's not necessarily like a big prospective trial that, that has shown that. 
I, I would I would note that two hours is outside of the FDA approved label for imaging with Polarify. Uh, I believe the Polarify label is something like 45 to 90 minutes or something like that. I don't think it goes out to two hours. So it would potentially be off label to use it at two hours, which isn't a big deal, just, just something to be aware of. The uh, What I think is maybe the more practical consideration is that uh, at two hours, you've used an uptake room for two hours and that may not work with your pet center workflow because everybody's getting imaged with FDG at one hour. So uh, so we use we use one hour because it fits in with our FDG workflow. And I, I, I think it's an uncommon patient uh, that's gonna benefit from imaging at two hours. If you do have the option though, there, there may be occasional patients for whom that would be beneficial. All right, uh, if uh, PSMA scan is negative in patients with rising PSA following initial, initial treatment, have you found FTG scans be of any value? Uh, no, I, I think FTG only really becomes a value when uh, you've got relatively advanced castration resistant disease. There are certainly FTG positive tumors that occur before that, but they're relatively uncommon. And uh, you know, I, I suppose a question could also be asked, is Axman useful in that case? I, I tend to think not either, uh, because I think most of the negative scans in, PSA, in, in that patient population are because of volume of disease, and, and there's no molecular imaging that's going to find them. So, so the question is whether a negative scan then triggers salvage radiation therapy still, or what we should do with that negative scan. But uh, I think right now, in, in the guidelines level uh, data, would, would I think support this statement that uh, PSMA is the most sensitive modality that we have for the biochemical recurrence setting, and that there's no real reason to believe that other modalities are, are going to be reasonable problem-solving tools. Um, the one, ex uh, you know, I take uh, there's one exception I think to that. In a patient who may have a local recurrence, maybe they have a positive margin at surgery, uh, dynamic contrast enhanced pelvic MR is a great tool. So, uh, so if you don't see anything on PSMA in that context. Uh, it, a, uh, a, a multi-parametric MR is, is maybe still a great option. All right, uh, if there is an equivocal transitional zone finding, is PSMA pet useful to decide biopsy versus active surveillance? Hmm. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of any data that would suggest that. There, there's, uh, there is data that PSMA pet can make you more confident kind of in reading the MRI. So I, uh, so if you if you did yeah I, I could certainly imagine a case where you've got something on MR it's pyrans three you know what, what do you really do with that it's blazing hot on pet that you go ahead and biopsy that uh, pattern four disease seems to be important for PSMA uptake uh, at least somewhat but um, but but again yeah not 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 aware of prospective data so uh, so it would. Uh, Again, I think you know insurance issues may may sort of come into play, but uh, but it is it would be it would be a reasonable step from a scientific standpoint. Uh, let's see, anonymous attendee, uh, do you uh, do you recommend stopping ADT for some weeks before doing PSA pet? Uh, we don't. Whatever the patient's on, uh, we figure that's sort of the state of their disease, and and we should go with that. So if uh, if they're on ADT and they've got a rising PSA. That would indicate they have viable disease that is progressing. It's likely to be PSMA avid, and we should go ahead and image them and, and take a look if uh, if if it's sort of otherwise reasonable to image them. So so yeah, we don't we don't really try to change uh, uh, change anything that the clinicians are going to do. Again, I think it's not always a uh, not always a great idea to to try to scan them right after initiation of ADT because weird things can be going on. But uh, but we don't we don't stop ADT generally. Okay, so uh, pyrite three peripheral zone lesion is PSMA useful to decide biopsy or not? Uh, again, uh, again, I think it it could be helpful, uh, which again is uh, uh, extrapolating from from data that isn't exactly in this uh, in this space. Uh, I think it could be helpful, uh, but I would uh, uh, I would. And you know, and if the patient has has known prostate cancer, uh, even if it's uh, well, you know, I guess the problem is anybody that's on surveillance is going to have at least favorable intermediate risk, and the guidelines don't recommend PSMA PET in that context. So again, insurers may have a problem with that. They, they, I don't, I don't, oh, I don't always know how nuanced they're getting with things, but uh, but I can imagine insurance being being an issue there. And then. Uh, uh, I maybe uh, maybe have time for for one more question here, and I think there's about one more question here. So uh, 
Are, are we administering Fluvicto? Do you think metastatic history of the men who refused chemo could be considered for therapy? Um, so the, prob the real problem there is that the uh, data that shows that men who are not post-chemo uh, and their benefit of Fluvicto hasn't been published yet. And so I, I don't believe an insurance company is going to pay for a $300,000 course of, of Fluvicto uh, on, on that basis. It's really the FDA labels only for post-chemotherapy men. So while I think that that we're, we're gonna move into an era very soon where we're giving Fluvicto pre-chemo or in men who don't want chemo, uh, we're not quite there yet. So, so we are only giving Fluvicto right now to men who have, have progressed on chemotherapy. Okay, and then you know, one last question. So I, I said one, one more, but we'll, we'll do this one. Um, do you handle focally intense PSMA uptake without CT correlate? So it depends on where it is. If it's in bone, um, I look really hard for a CT correlate because sometimes the CT correlates are are very uh, very subtle. They may be like you know something that's maybe minimally expansile that might be a good fit for fibrous dysplasia. Uh, if uh, so, so in, in bone, I think it can be tricky. But if it's really intense, we do have to take it seriously. Uh, if it's outside of bone, if it's in soft tissue, I guess I'm. I it, it would be very case dependent. Uh, I, uh, uh, if it was truly out in the middle of nowhere and there's no lymph node around, I, I wouldn't be sure what to think of that. Uh, in other organ systems, it, it may require additional workup, like if it's in the liver, uh, that, that could be an HCC or something. We may have to go hunt that down a little bit. Uh, but uh, uh, but yeah, it would, it would sort of it would sort of depend a little bit. And then if it's in the prostate, uh, it's almost certainly prostate cancer, and uh, uh, and that's presumably, I guess, why the patient would be being imaged. Um, and with that, I do apologize. I I, I will going to have to run. I, I know there's uh, there's probably other questions that will trickle in, but uh, it's really been a pleasure uh, joining you today. And I hope this was uh, I hope this was a useful. Uh, uh, a useful uh, uh, talk, and I uh, really thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you for some great questions, and uh, uh, hope everybody has has fun reading these scans. Thank you. Thank again. you so much, Dr. Rowe. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, you can access the recording of today's conference and all our previous noon conferences by creating a free MRI online account. Be sure to join us next week for a noon conference double feature uh, starting on Tuesday, July 25th at 12 p.m. Eastern featuring Dr. Stephen J. Pomerantz for a lecture on wrist MRI. And on Thursday, July 27th at 12 p.m. Eastern, Dr. Deborah Baumgarten for a case-based review of renal pathology. You can register for this free lecture at mrionline.com and follow us on social media for updates on future noon conferences. Thanks again and have a great day.